Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 25th annual Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy. 25 years. I'm... I'm Bob Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, and I, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight here at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. This is the largest audience we've had in the 25 years of the lecture. House is full. Thank you. As you all know, the Hanks Lecture is a nonpartisan annual opportunity to hear one person's unfettered opinion about the state and future of the arts in our country. And it's our honor to welcome, in a few moments, critically acclaimed actor, Emmy Award winner, and activist Alec Baldwin to the stage. What I want to say is that no artist, no person, has advocated harder to advance support for the arts in this country. So, yeah. Twenty-five years ago, for the inaugural lecture, policy visionary Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. said, surely government has as strong an obligation to preserve the cultural environment against dissipation and destruction as it has to preserve the natural environment against pollution and decay. We here, all of you, get to remind government of that obligation annually. And so I want to take a moment to talk about Arts Advocacy Day tomorrow. Hundreds of you from all across the country will walk the halls of Congress to meet with your representatives, your senators, to make the case for federal support for the arts and for arts education. This year, an election year, it's crucially important to help decision makers understand the power of the arts in building better communities and better lives. I hope that tonight inspires you to do just that, and I know it will. I also hope that all of you tweeters in the room will share your experiences tonight and at Arts Advocacy Day tomorrow to help spread the message all across America. The more people we get involved, the better. So use the hashtag uh, AAD12 to keep the rest of the country up to date on our advocacy activities here. Arts Advocacy Day and the Hanks Lecture cannot happen without a lot of hard work. And I want to thank my own extraordinary staff, Nina Oslu and all of the staff at Americans for the Arts. Thank you. And on behalf of our great board of directors and the staff of Americans for the Arts, I want to thank the 87 local, state, and national organizations that have co-sponsored Arts Advocacy Day this year and have endorsed a national United Arts Policy Platform. And I would like to ask the Americans for the Arts board, staff, and the representatives of all of those organizations to please stand to be recognized tonight. I also want to thank all of the Arts Advocacy Day registrants and all of our um, Americans for the Arts board members and Business Committee for the Arts Executive board members who are here to help make tonight and tomorrow a success. Some 15 years ago, board member and friend Dr. Billy Taylor said on this stage, there are thousands of American artists who are well-trained and ready and willing to use their creativity for the good of the society that spawned them we should not waste this resource. Well, we have such artists with us uh, tonight. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that our lecturer, Alec Baldwin, will join us all day tomorrow on Capitol Hill. And he's joined by fellow actors, um, Melina Kenna, uh, Kari, Kari, say, okay. Now I practiced that a whole bunch of times. <laughs> Melina Kenna uh Omar Benson Miller, <clears throat> Jonathan uh, Sheck, um, Tiffany Thiessen, musicians Ben Folds, Clay Walker, environmental architect Kulapat Yantrasat, dancer and choreographer Pierre Dulaine, and executive producer of American Idol and So You Think You Can Dance, Nigel Lithgow, also uh, a trained and accomplished dancer. Uh, a round of applause for the artists who showed up. And it is now my very great pleasure to introduce one of these artists, Arts Advocacy Day co-chair 
and actor Hill Harper. Hill, yes. <laughs> Hill is absolutely great, and he's been with us in the past. He's an American film and television and stage actor and author. He's an alumnus of Harvard Law School. He's best known for his portrayal of Dr. Sheldon Hawks on the CBS drama television series CSI New York, which I understand from him is the best of the CSI uh, series. Um, <laughs> Hill is also the author of several books that have empowered young people, Letters to a Young Brother, Manifest Your Destiny, Letters to a Young Sister, Define Your Destiny, How Men and Women Can Build Loving, Trusting Relationships, and The Wealth Cure, Putting Money in Its Place. Like many of you, whatever party, whatever candidate, he's also a political advocate, campaigning for President Obama and a member of the Obama for America National Finance Committee. So. Please join me in, uh, in, in welcoming a, a great actor, a great artist, a great friend, and the co-chair of National Arts Advocacy Day, Hill Harper. Thank you, Bob. Hey, everyone. just want to say thank you so much. First, I want to say, Bob, don't feel bad. You know, I worked with Melina for seven years on CSI New York, and I couldn't get her name right either. So, you know... I couldn't be more pleased uh, to serve this year's co-chair uh, of Arts Advocacy Day with uh, Charles Seegers of Ovation. Give a round of applause for Charles. He's, he's so dedicated year after year. And as, and as Bob said, you know, hundreds of us tomorrow are going to go to Capitol Hill, and, and we're going to present a unified vision to Congress on a range of important issues in terms of policy that, that impact all of us in terms of arts and arts education in this country. I myself have a foundation called the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation where we work directly with eighth graders transitioning into high school to, to, with an attempt to deal with the dropout crisis. And certainly arts education is, is a key component of, of our curriculum. And as I think about that, I'm, I'm, being here in the Kennedy Center, I'm reminded of, of, of one of my favorite quotes. Uh, in this case, it was from Bobby Kennedy, where he said, the future does not belong to those who are fearful of bold projects and new ideas, but rather the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage into a personal commitment to the great ideals and enterprises of American society. And to me, those words, passion, reason, and courage, represent what we're fighting for when we talk about the arts and what's best in America. Passion. There's no artist, and, and if you are an artist or you know an artist, you know an artist uses passion to create their art and to create something that can live beyond them, create legacy. Reason, which means to me critical thinking skills, the idea of linking thought and creativity, something that, that we need in, in America's workforce today more than ever. And true innovators have been taught art through their process. And finally, the word courage. It's one of my favorite words, the etymology or the, the root of that word, and if you speak French, you know this, is cour, which means heart. And I think many of us are linked because of our hearts. And that's why we're here today. Dr. King said that we're all tied together in a garment of mutual destiny, which means to me that no matter how well I may be doing in Hollywood, if a, if a young brother or a young sister in the South Bronx or South Chicago or South Central Los Angeles is not doing well, then I'm not doing well. And what I'm dedicated to do is to make sure that I make our representatives realize that the only reason I could be one of the few people who ever went to an Ivy League school and, and let alone went to Harvard Law School and got a graduate degree from my public school, the only reason I was able to come out of that public education system is because I went to a public school or, and had a, a public school district that was dedicated to funding the arts. I had, I had painting. I was able to go to drawing classes and painting. I had music. I, I did carry a recorder, which they, my friends used to call the ghetto flute. <laughs> the ghetto flute. But that's arts education. I took a theater class and it changed my life. I was then able to go to Brown University, the first person from my high school to go to Brown. And I took another theater class there and I, I continued. And, but I still didn't. I didn't know if I wanted to be an actor or not went to Harvard Law School and then the Kennedy School of Government, but I, but I joined a repertory company in Boston while I was there. 
And you see, the introduction of art is what's critical. And the fact that we have 20% less funding for arts education over the past 10 years is deplorable when, when we should be pouring more money into arts education funding. We know the data shows us that $1 spent pays back $8. It's smart policy. So let's go there tomorrow and let the Hill know that we're all tied together in this garment of mutual destiny. And I couldn't be more proud to be working with this group of people. Thank you so much. Thanks to Hill, a tireless advocate, a great friend, and he'll be with us tomorrow. We have a number of special guests in the audience tonight. Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Mr. Rocco Lannisman, and his wife, Debbie. <laughs> President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities Executive Director, Rachel Goslins, and Co-Chair George Stevens, Jr. And the first guy I got to work with in that office, former Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Frank Hotzel. We have many members of, of Congress and friends from the Hill here, but I want, to, uh, I want to say thank you to Senator Tom Udall. Thank you, sir, for your leadership in authoring the Dear Colleague letter in support of the NEA for the last three years. Thank you. We have with us Mayors Elizabeth Kautz from Burnsville, um, Minnesota, Chair of the um, of U.S. Conference of Mayors, and Mitch Landrew, New Orleans uh, Mayor, uh, and with them Tom Co Cochran, our great friend, CEO of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> two years ago, two years ago, Mayor Joe Riley was up here, and he put it simply: "The arts have transformed my city." And I know, speaking to you, I know your passion, your energy, your sacrifice, your determination, and your commitment to excellence transforms the towns and the cities of America. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank our partners and sponsors. Ovation already mentioned, whose CEO, Charles Seegers, is serving as co-chair of Arts Advocacy Day, and whose chairman, Ken Solomon, will be joining me on stage shortly to introduce tonight's programming. Um, have been great friends, but uh, Charles has been a specifically great co-chair, and I would like Charles to stand. Uh, I think he's over there somewhere, so Charles. There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Um, Nancy Stevens, Rick Rosenthal, Mick Rosenthal, and Jamie Wolf of the Rosenthal Family Foundation, which has a long family of uh, tradition of support and engagement with this Hanks lecture, are here. Alan Blevins, Stephanie Madden, and the team at Bank of America, um, and Tom Davis and Nolan Bivens at General Dynamics. Your partnership and extraordinary generosity have played a key role in making this evening and our work over these two days possible. Thank you so much. And now it is my privilege to introduce tonight's performance. Um, it has been, uh, this performance is being led by an artist who has enjoyed worldwide success through the course of his 18-year recording career. Ben Folds is a musician and a producer and um, performing also as a solo artist as well as with the alternative rock band Ben Folds 5. He's contributed to multiple movie soundtracks and is a judge on the um, NBC a cappella singing contest, The Sing-Off. As a board member of the Nashville Symphony Orchestra, he's been instrumental in elevating the status of the arts in Nashville, and he founded the Ben Folds Key to Music City campaign with the symphony. Ben is joined tonight by uh, a group that we've put together especially for the evening, alumni from the organization Young Arts. And uh, this is the core program of the National Foundation for Advancement in the Arts, uh, which recognizes and supports America's most talented 17 to 18 year olds in the visual, literary, and performing arts. Young Arts identifies emerging artists and assists them at crucial 
um, junctures in their educational and professional development and is the nominating agency for the Presidential Scholars for the Arts. Today, we are joined by seven fabulous musicians who have participated in this Young Arts program. A number of them have helped us with our advocacy work um, throughout the year. Rebecca Anderson, Anna Catherine Barnett Hart, Benny Benek, Bobby Chen, Kate Davis, Corey Dundee, and Dave Feldman. Uh, both Rebecca and Kate have helped us. Welcome to all of them. And so here to perform two numbers for us tonight, The Luckiest and Zach and Sarah, please welcome Ben Folds and the Young Arts Alumni. How about my band?
We're uh, honored to be here. We've been a band since uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> we could have made a record this afternoon. It was going really well. We're, we're, um, we're, I'm here because I'm a product of uh, public school system, music education, well-rounded education, and this is one way of giving back and thanking civilization for having given me that, uh, <laughs> that opportunity. Uh, civilization's good. <laughs> we like civilization. I think, uh, you know, in, in civilization, um, arts and arts education, uh, is, it's, not a, it's not a luxury. It's a necessity for civilization. And uh, so that's why we're here. I don't get paid to speak. I play piano. <laughs> All right, that's it. All right. I don't get many things right. First time, in fact, I am told that a lot. Now I know all the wrong turns, the stumbles and falls brought me here. No. 
Thank you. Thank you so much to Ben, and thank you to all of our good friends, the Young Arts uh, Artists. Um, yes. And I would like to ask you for a second round of applause for the woman who made Young Arts possible, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Marilyn Arison. Lynn is here with us tonight, along with the Executive Director of Young Arts, Paul Lair. It takes somebody like that to make this possible, and I thank them very much. Americans for the Arts is greatly ple pleased to be partnering with Ovation, sponsoring this Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts Advocacy Day. Ovation is the only multi-platform network dedicated to arts and culture, available now to 51 million cable and satellite television households all across the United States. On air, online, and on the ground, Ovation has been one of the nation's most ardent champions of the arts, and it continues to bring all forms of art to a diverse national audience. And Ovation also provides an extraordinary level of direct support to arts and cultural institutions, many of you here. Over the past six years alone, Ovation has contributed over $10 million in direct and in-kind gifts to nonprofit arts and cultural institutions and agencies, an amount unprecedented among television networks of any size. Yeah. Now, as I said before, um, we are honored to have Ken Solomon, Ovation's chairman, with us this evening. And I've known Ken since the Ovation of today was just an idea. As chairman, Ken has been instrumental in helping to develop Ovation's business plan and its new programming and branding. In addition to his work at Ovation, Ken is also chairman and chief executive officer of the Tennis Channel, the only 24-hour television-based multimedia destination uh, to tennis and the lifestyle that surrounds it. He's held top posts at Universal Television, DreamWorks, News Corps, Scripps, where he uh, founded and led the Fine Living Network. Ken is dedicated to the preservation and advancement of the arts and of arts education in his work and in his life. And he is a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. And in fact, he sits on our own Americans for the Arts Business Committee for the Arts Executive Board. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Ken for his tremendous personal support and that offered by uh, the entire Ovation team, Charles, Chad, Gaynor, Brad, Sonia, and Susie, um, all who are here helping us with this endeavor. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Ken to the stage. Thank you. Could any of us have a better friend than Bob Lynch? Let's hear it for Bob Lynch. I, he, he is, as you know, extraordinary, a force of nature. I will never forget the first time Bob called me. Uh, it was over a decade ago. I remember where I was standing, and he said he was impressed with what we were doing, and he asked me to speak at an Americans for the Arts gathering. When he was finished making the pitch, I remember staring into the phone and without hesitation told him he must have the wrong Ken Solomon. I'm the TV executive, and we're not routinely used to being consulted for our views on arts and culture. Well, <laughs> Bob assured me that I was the right guy, and despite his clearly ill-conceived thesis, we've been great friends and, and partners and soldiers in the battle for the arts ever since. Now, I have to admit, as you could imagine, it's humbling to find myself between such an accomplished artist as Ben Folds, who, can we just one more time, I mean, can you believe it? He's incredible. And our next speaker, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Maureen Dowd. Another, come on, let's have it. All the while standing on this storied stage in front of you, an audience that has given so much to furthering the arts in America. 
So on behalf of Ovation, Charles, and our entire team, which Bob did such a good job in, in mentioning every single last one of our employees, <laughs> we are the only arts TV network in America, I want to say an official thank you. Now, Ocean, o Ovation believes that the support of the arts is one of the greatest measurements of the health of our democracy. And as a private enterprise, as you just heard, we put our money where our mouths are. To date, Ovation has given actually over $12 million to the arts and arts education. Thank you. And thank you. And, and more importantly, we're proud to fight right alongside all of you and, all, and next to AFTA. And of course, my good friend Rocco, who, along with the National Endowment for the Arts, is here to continue the extraordinary programs that fundamentally change so many lives and shape our country for the better. Now, it is no surprise that it's once again a campaign year, and yes, already the economic rhetoric has begun and the arts have become shockingly a budget target. But as creative people, I'd, I'd ask you all to imagine for just a moment a campaign year where fostering the arts was instead held out as a prize to be coveted. In this campaign, candidates would regularly proclaim what we all know, that the arts and an investment in it leads to economic return on that investment literally like no other. Politicians would tell you how NEA programs create jobs and how this relatively small level of support vastly improves public education and prepares the next generation, most importantly, of our young people to lead the charge in the new global software economy. Candidates would clamor for the credit in championing the NEA for what it is, good business. Those are the indisputable facts. And any campaign rhetoric you'll hear in the days and weeks to come must be exposed for what they truly are, cheap theatrics for short-term political gain. It's true. And that's why our Ovation team is proud to fight alongside each and every one of you and most excited to celebrate the arts tonight. So now for the fun. Here to introduce this year's Nancy Hanks guest lecture is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist born and raised right here in the nation's capital. She launched her career at the Washington Star, has written for Time magazine, and in 1983 joined the New York Times Washington Bureau. That led her to becoming the White House correspondent for the Times, covering four presidential campaigns. And in 1995, she became the columnist. She became a columnist at the Times op-ed page, where she is, if I may, say myself, become a bit of a rock star and continues to inform and entertain us each and every day. She's authored two books, including Are Men Necessary and When Sexes Collide, both of which I'll be speaking with about her uh, later, right after this. <laughs> but I have to tell you, in our home, she is considered the E.F. Hutton of opinion. When she writes, we listen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming an American original, the one and only Maureen Dowd. Wow, I have never seen this many people before, much less spoken. I'm terrified. <laughs> Alec Baldwin has a problem. <laughs> we all know it, so we may as well talk about it. <clears throat> the man needs to come out of his shell. He's pathologically repressed, completely unable to express his feelings or share his emotions. I worry about him, all bottled up, keeping everything inside. He was probably scarred at an early age when his surname, Baldwin, became a synonym for smoking hot. Who can live with that kind of pressure? Or maybe he was damaged from his days as a busboy at Studio 54. Prolonged exposure to disco has been known to derange. 
Alec got famous starring in soap operas, not just his personal ones. <laughs> he started his professional career with roles in The Doctors and Knott's Landing. Alexander Ray Baldwin III was born in Amityville. Just saying. <laughs> Raised in a nice Irish Catholic family in Massapequa, Long Island, hanging out at Jones Beach, Alec is not your typical self-absorbed, credit-hogging star. I first realized this in 1992 when I was doing a cover story for GQ on Al Pacino. I called several of the famous actors who were starring with Pacino in Glengarry Glen Ross to interview them about what it was like to work with Al. Their press agents called me back to explain that the actors would not talk to me for a story about Pacino. They would only talk if they were the subject of the piece. <laughs> One who called back to generous, generously praise Pacino was Alec Baldwin. Alec has conjured magic on stage and screen with equal weight given to serious and silly. How many other performers can knock it out of the park with a streetcar named Desire on Broadway and a sweaty ball sketch on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> For all his dazzling talent and devotion to arts advocacy and animal rights, Alec never makes it easy on himself. He loves Rhapsody in Blue, and sometimes he lives it. He's relentlessly self-critical, offering a Joycean stream of consciousness on the vicissitudes of life. As his friend Lorne Michael says, he guards against enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> Alec claims he's not talented at movie acting and says being on a sitcom is like being a pastry chef rather than a top chef. Yet, he's all about the quality of the work not the star trappings or the trap of making movies just to buy mansions and closets full of Italian suits. His friend Marcy Klein, who produces 30 Rock and Saturday Night Live, said that Alec's idea of a good night is take out Mexican in an old movie. He had just broken into Hollywood's leading man club in 1990 as Jack Ryan in Hunt for Red October when he let the lucrative Tom Clancy franchise go to play Stanley Kowalski on stage. Frank Rich said it was the first Stanley that didn't leave one longing for Brando. Alec resisted joining the cast of 30 Rock, but NBC refused to greenlight it without him. He made the show a critical sensation by bringing to life the slick and shameless right-wing network executive Jack Donaghy who wears a tux after six because he is not, after all, a farmer, <laughs> and who has tax shelters because he is not, after all, an immigrant. <laughs> Hilariously sending up his own bumpy trajectory, Alec as Jack told Tracy Jordan, do TV. No one will ever take you seriously again. Doesn't matter how big of a movie star you are. Even if you've had a career where you've walked away from a blockbuster franchise or worked with Meryl Streep or Anthony Hopkins, made important movies about things like civil rights or Pearl Harbor, stole films with supporting roles, and then turned around and blew them away on Broadway, none of that will matter when you do television. <laughs> you can win every award in sight, you can be the biggest thing on the small screen, and you'll still get laughed out of the Vanity Fair Oscar party <laughs> by Greg Kinnear. <laughs> Despite the self-deprecation, Alec knows what Joel McRae learned in Sullivan's Travels, that when Americans are going through tough times, having the respite of laughter is a wonderful thing. As Alec collected two Emmys, four Golden Globes, seven Screen Actors Guild Awards, making him the single male with the most SAGs ever, he did something no big shot TV star has ever done, something weirder in its way than Charlie Sheen ranting about warlocks and tiger blood. 
Instead of supersizing, he downsized. For the love of Mahler and Rachmaninoff, he signed up to host the New York Philharmonic's weekly, nationally syndicated radio broadcast. For the love of culture and politics, he started an interview show on New York Public Radio that has been praised for its raconturial aplomb and refreshing lack of sycophancy. <laughs> and for the love of old movies, he began co-hosting The Essentials on Turner Classic Movies with Robert Osborne. Let brain-dead Hollywood devolve to filming comic books and random phrases like he's just not that into you. <laughs> Alec can be found on cable offering homages to searing social dramas such as On the Waterfront and To Kill a Mockingbird. Most audiences, he told the New York Times, think acting is crying and most actors think acting is yelling. But to me, Acting is Bob Duval in To Kill a Mockingbird. Because, <laughs> because you crush the audience without saying a word. Whatever Alec is doing, he throws himself into it with rare passion. When I interviewed him for a Vanity Fair cover story on Tina Fey in 2008, he launched into an intense soliloquy, wondering if Liz Lemon would ever be attracted to Jack Donaghy. After 15 minutes, I gently reminded Alec that these were fictional characters. <laughs> As a political columnist hungry for material, I dream that Alec will pursue his simmering ambition to run for political office and end up president. <clears throat> That would be one wild and crazy White House. <laughs> the New York newspapers have been running stories about how, now that he's engaged to a beautiful yoga instructor, Alec's life will be dramatically changed by yoga. The stories... <laughs> the stories suggest that vinyasa, Shavasana and Chaturanga will calm Alec down, <laughs> as in downward dog, <laughs> and move him into a very zen, tranquil place. And I can only say to that, God, I hope not. <laughs> Just as you don't mess with nature, you shouldn't mess with forces of nature. There are too few larger-than-life figures in the world as it is. A Los Angeles Times reporter described the feeling when Alec left a room. Quote, the room was suddenly empty of a consuming, marvelous, anxious energy. The apartment had been like a bay full of tall chop, his weight pushing everyone around unexpectedly. And then after him, it was boring and flat. I think when Alex comes into a room, he offers a flash of scaramouche who was born with the gift of laughter and a sense that the world was mad. And with that, I give you the mad genius himself, Alec Baldwin. Here we go. You're the rose between here. Thank you. You are funny. Oh. Isn't she something, folks? <laughs> <sighs> Could you imagine living with Maureen Dowd? <laughs> Lying in bed, the end of the long day, hearing her give you her take on the world. She is really something else. Uh, I actually want that introduction read in every appearance I make from now on. I'm going to have that printed. 
I want to say thank you to Maureen Dow. Let's have another round of applause for Maureen. Oh. <clears throat> I want to say thanks to, of course, Bob Lynch, Nina Oslu, uh, a special thanks to Ovation for all of their support, the staff of Americans for the Arts, the organization's supporters who help make this annual pilgrimage to Washington possible, and to all of you, the stalwart missionaries who travel each year to this remote swamp <laughs> in an attempt to persuade the isolated, ignorant, though well-meaning natives <laughs> to, to come out of their marble huts and discover the civilizing powers of the arts. <clears throat> um, uh, today I will attempt to distill my own relationship to the arts <clears throat> over the past half century into these remarks, I would divide that period of over 50 years into three groups. One, I'll call art is all around me, but I don't know what art is. The second, I'll call art is all around me, so maybe I should introduce myself. And the third is called so much art, so little time. As a child, <clears throat> I grew up in a middle-class Long Island suburb in the 1960s and 70s. My father was a public school teacher, my mother a housewife with six children. Back then, if you asked what the arts meant to me, I would have just stared at you blankly, struggling to come up with a redeeming answer. My parents were not opera buffs. They played no instruments, nor did they frequent art galleries or poetry readings. They did not venture into New York City to avail themselves of the countless opportunities that exist there for devotees of classical music, painting, photography, dance, architecture, theater, etc. For most kids in my neighborhood, in fact, trips to the Guggenheim or the Met were rare, if ever. In our classrooms, discussions of Monet and Giverny or the raft of the Medusa the work of Frederick Remington or Michelangelo or Brancusi were infrequent, if at all. Conversations about Warhol or Maplethorpe, never. <laughs> Yet, art came into my life then in random and unlikely ways, and most of it through television and films. And as I look back on my childhood, art was indeed everywhere. I just didn't know it. Movies and television were the primary source of this exposure, going back to the artistry of Walt Disney and his renowned animators. I look back on all of the children's films I watched again and again during that time. One was the 1934 release, Babes in Toyland, and starring Laurel and Hardy. The art director was Ed Brandenburg, and the visual effects were by Ray Seabright, who rendered sequences in that film that are some of the most vivid and memorable I'd ever seen as a child, before Jaws and Star Wars and computers. As a child, I loved the 1939 version of Gulliver's Travels, which according to IMDb lists 45 animators that worked on that project. This is a beautiful film that I believe holds up even today as a great work in animated films. The Wizard of Oz is a favorite of nearly everyone. However, beyond Judy Garland, the rest of the cast, and all of the great music, what else do you remember? Would it be sets and costumes? William Horning was one of the art directors on that film. He also designed films such as Quo Vadis, The Tea House of the August Moon, Rain Tree County, Can on a Hot Tin Roof, North by Northwest, and Ben-Hur, among others. Another art director on the film was Cedric Gibbons, who also helped design the 1935 version of Mutiny on the Bounty with Clark Gable and Charles Lawton, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mrs. Miniver, Anchors Away, the 1946 version of The Postman Always Rings Twice with John Garfield and Lana Turner, The Asphalt Jungle, An American in Paris, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, to name but a few of his lengthy credits. Gibbons 
attended the Art Students League in New York, graduating in 1915. He went on to win 11 Academy Awards and was nominated 28 times. Gibbons and Seawright are the ones who gave us the yellow brick road, or at least the one you can see on film. Judy Garland, while she skipped down that road, wore costumes designed by Adrian Greenberg, who designed under the name Adrian. Adrian is considered among the most successful costume designers in movie history who actually never won an Academy Award. Through motion pictures, dance also came into my life early as well. I was a child in Massapequa in 1968. We didn't dance around the neighborhood with a combination of simmering violence and balletic grace. <laughs> but when I saw West Side Story, I wanted to dance like them, in a gang. <laughs> I wanted to gang dance. I wanted to have gang fights, but with dancing. <laughs> I watched Russ Tamblin flying around that playground, tough, smirking, agile. I snapped my fingers all the time. <laughs> Under my breath, I hummed, da na 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 bum, bum, bum. <laughs> My mother glared at me. Worried that another rumble was about to break out between, between the ethnic factions living under her roof. <clears throat> the great Jerome Robbins choreographed the dance sequences in that film, and Jerome Robbins might as well have come to Massapequa and walked into my living room and pulled me off my couch because for a very long time I wanted to be a shark or a jet. It didn't really matter. I wanted to dance. It looks so fun, so freeing. The classical music repertoire also hovered around my childhood and in, a, in unusual places. In the 1960s, the closing credits, I mean, I hope some people in this room remember this. In the 1960s, the closing credits of the Huntley Brinkley News Program, the great-grandfather to Brian Williams at the NBC News Anchor Desk, featured Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the second movement, a version that was recorded by Arturo Toscanini with the NBC Symphony Orchestra in 1952. I had no idea that NBC had an orchestra, no doubt, a holdover from NBC's radio heyday. And who was this Toscanini guy? <laughs> Yet there in Studio 8H, the current home of Saturday Night Live, a television network housed a symphony orchestra, a great symphony orchestra. Can you imagine such a thing today? Another piece of music from my earliest childhood st stayed with me for decades. It was a tune I literally could not get out of my head. A couple of years ago, I found myself working as the radio announcer of the New York Philharmonic's weekly broadcast. In my first season with the Phil, as I stood backstage after, an appoint after a performance next to maestro Alan Gilbert, I recalled that tune. And I asked Alan, if I hummed a piece of classical music, would you be able to tell me what it is? <laughs> I am having trouble remembering the name. <laughs> Alan said that he probably could. I hummed the tune for Alan. Here is a recording of that tune, which I performed for Alan. <laughs> When I finished my virtuosic, impassioned humming, <laughs> I turned to a patient, Alan, who may have wondered if this was the beginning of some type of game he would now have to endure. <laughs> and he said, I, I don't know. <laughs> About a month later, as I surfed YouTube for a clip from an old TV show, I came upon an unrelated item and paused, my memory now jarred, I hit that clip, and there was the tune that we just played, the theme to Captain Kangaroo.
The piece, the piece is actually called Puff and Billy, written in 1952 by British composer Edward White. And the music evokes the railways of the Isle of Wight that the composer knew. It was also used in BBC children's programming in the 1950s. The Broadway theater was one cultural opportunity that I was occasionally able to access and enjoy growing up, as cost was always a factor. The first Broadway show I, sh I saw was Shenandoah with John Cullum. And although it would be a few more years before I summoned the courage to make that effort myself, Cullum made an indelible impression on me, as did Brian Bedford in Death Trap and the Broadway production of The Wiz. Like any child, as I grew, my horizons broadened, but clearly skewed toward realism in cinema. I was slowly exposed to the editing of George Tomasini in Hitchcock's Psycho, the award-winning cinematography of Jeffrey Unsworth, who shot 2001, A Space Odyssey, Gordon Willis, who photographed such diverse films as The Godfather and Clute, and John Alonzo, who shot Chinatown. I bought a paperback edition of William Goldman's great screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid after I had seen the movie three or four times in the theater. I was fascinated, even at that age, to see this example of the blueprints from which films are made. And then there was acting, always the acting, sitting in the dark, hour after hour, transfixed by the incessant, impassioned waves that came over me from James Stewart, Cagney, Bogart, Betty Davis, Gable, Barbara Stanwyck, John Garfield, Mitchum, Kirk Douglas, Richard Burton, Brando, Elizabeth Taylor, Jane Fonda, Pacino. I'm skipping over a bit, <clears throat> but now comes the second part. I came here to Washington in 1976 to attend George Washington University. I still had no money, but I'm living in a city. D.C. wasn't a great city back then, but it was on its way to becoming one. Back then, during my freshman year, protesters were burning the Shah of Iran in effigy in Lafayette Park. Today, you might get shot if you even lit a match in Lafayette Park. <laughs> so it was a different era. It was here in Washington that I discovered architecture, having bypassed living in Manhattan en route to college. Now, not to pick on my hometown, but Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Richard Neutra were not designing many of the buildings going up in Massapequa during my childhood. <laughs> so it was in Washington that I became familiar with L'Enfant, who arrived here in 1791 to build the federal capital city. Washington, to an unsophisticated 18-year-old, was beautiful and inspiring beyond my imagination. I played touch football many weekends right in view of the Lincoln Memorial designed by Henry Bacon, who also designed the DuPont Circle Fountain. Nearly every day that I lived here, I walked past the White House, designed around 1792 by James Hoban and expanded by Benjamin Latrobe in 1801. I thought about all of the men and women who worked there, struggled there, tried and failed there, Ambition had driven many men and a few women to want to reside there. At that time, from 1976 to 1979, I was one of those people. I wanted to be the President of the United States. Then again, so did three of my five sweet mates at the dorm on 19th and F. <laughs> However, sitting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on many nights then, the idea seemed <clears throat> so real, so right. Nothing makes you love your country as much as the architecture of Washington, D.C. Back then, <clears throat> yeah. back then I took the train from Union Station here to Penn Station in New York, a one-way ticket on the last train out at around 9 p.m. was 19 bucks. I couldn't afford to fly. Daniel Burnham designed Union Station. Burnham had many famous commissions during his career, most notably in Chicago. Along with Frederick Dinkelberg, Burnham also designed the Flatiron Building in New York. It occurred to me, as I traveled to the presumably more sophisticated New York, that Union Station was a monument and Penn Station was a dump. <laughs> <laughs> the
Thus, it was around that time that I did some research and learned that the original Penn Station, the legendary McKim, Mead, and White design circa 1910, had been destroyed in 1963 in order to build the current monstrosity. <laughs> that act, which drew outrage from around the world, led to the creation of the Landmarks Preservation Commission in New York in 1965. Everywhere in Washington were handsome, if not stunning, buildings you believed might never come down. Meanwhile, New Yorkers are reminded of Fran Lebowitz's comment about New York as a place where, quote, they tear down a building and always put up an uglier building. <laughs> While a student in Washington, I took advantage, though never quite enough, of student discounts for the many museums and other cultural institutions that are here, yet I must admit that seeing films was still my primary preoccupation. While at GW, I discovered art films, and the world opened up another notch again. I got a job in GW student government, part of which was selecting and screening films for students. But more often than not, I could be found at the Circle Theater on 21st in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you remember the question? <laughs> The Pettis brothers had opened that theater in 1957 as part of a chain of screens they owned that grew to 70. The first film I saw there was Last Tango in Paris. I learned a lot from that film. <laughs> and not just about sex. I learned about film acting. Oddly enough, I was introduced to Francis Bacon watching the title sequence of that film, just as Lolita, the film, introduced me to Nabokov, and Paths of Glory introduced me to the specific brutality of World War I and to the folly and insanity of military justice. Films instantly became a prism through which one could reimagine their view of the world. The circle was torn down in 1986 and became a parking lot, and I think it's now an office building. Did you hear that, Fran Leibowitz? At GW, I took my first acting class, acting for non-drama majors. <laughs> I was terrible. I was terrible. But I suppose I was less terrible than everybody else. So I transferred to NYU, studied acting at Tisch, and became an actor, which I still, to this day, consider bizarre. Now. With a few exceptions, I'm going to skip over most of this part, although it is reasonable to assume that during the past 30 years, I have met and or worked with some of the most talented and well-regarded designers, cinematographers, editors, costumers, directors, writers, and actors in the business. But I want to tell you about what I'm doing in the arts now, right now, and how art is more important in my life than ever. While performing on a soap opera in New York, my first job ever was on that show. We taped a scene, my death scene, actually. It was the end of my contract. And I was being killed off the show. This is a true story. Two people shot me simultaneously who were unaware of each other's presence. <laughs> through a window and through a doorway, two people who were unaware shot me simultaneously. Now, it's very soap opera-ish, but very interesting when you think about it. I think it is. My character was a very amoral young man. He deserved to be shot twice <laughs> for two completely different motivations. During the scene, certain evocative music played. I turned to our casting director, who happened to be on the set that day, the wonderful Roger Sturdivant. Sturdivant was one of those New Yorkers I met early on who just pulsed artistic sophistication. What is that music, I asked Roger. Roger looked at me askance with a cigarette in his hand. People smoked on TV studios back then. Roger looked at me askance and said, it's the Symphony Fantastique, the march to the scaffold. <laughs> <laughs> Parenthetically, doesn't everyone know that? <laughs> Roger meant well. But I was chastised. I left work that day a changed man. Whatever latent learning may have occurred in my high school music class, when Mr. Stoll 
my music teacher, attempted to elevate our musical taste with Minotti operas like the, the telephone and the medium, that latent learning suddenly kicked in. Roger's tone matched Fred Stoll's tone. This music is something you should acquaint yourself with, if not now, then one day, and hopefully soon. Because the sooner you begin to appreciate this music, the better your life will be. In the ensuing years, I moved to Los Angeles in order to find work. Driving in my car hour after hour in the mid-80s, the radio was on nearly all the time. Music that had once seduced me now abandoned me. I was awash in tunes and lyrics that were geared more toward either 15-year-old girls or adults with some sort of unidentified brain disorder. I turned on a classical station and I was home. Before the advent of the internet and cell phones uh, were primarily car phones, I would pause outside the gates of Warner Brothers or Paramount and write down the time that a particular piece was playing. Eventually, I would have the number of each classical station's program director on speed dial on my phone. I'd call and ask what piece had played, what orchestra, what conductor, what label. Before archive music and ordering online, I would head down to Tower Classical on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. Yes, yes, yes. And I would order my selections, and if they weren't already in stock, they'd mail them to me. Thus, my classical music education began not in a classroom, but in a Chevy Tahoe. <laughs> Driving on the Ventura Freeway in 1985, on my way to work in the gilded coal mines of the entertainment industry. <laughs> I found what I liked. George Schulte in the Chicago, Andre Previn in the LSO, Zell in the Cleveland, Charles Dutrois in the Montreal, Leonard Slatkin in the St. Louis, Stokowski, Muti, Mata, Meta, Barenboim, Boulez, Bernstein. I never went back to popular music. Occasionally, I only visit my old friends, usually. However, I hear new music today and I think, well, I hope that goes well for them. <laughs> and I switch back to what I love. This appreciation has led me to realize that this is something I could have, could have, under different circumstances, dedicated all of my life to, and I would have been very happy. But I did not have that opportunity. Where I grew up, how I grew up, these kinds of choices were not really available to us. Those people who had both the money and the inclination could influence their children in that direction, but for me, no. And when I say that I could have spent my life working in the world of classical music, I do not necessarily mean as a musician or conductor. However, I do tell Dutrois when I see him that if I could be someone else for a month, it would be Charles. <clears throat> Arts administration as many of you know, is an essential aspect of any creative experience. And a career in that field is worthwhile indeed. I have become good friends with Zarin Mehta and his wife Carmen Mehta. Zarin is the outgoing executive director of the New York Philharmonic, having served there for 12 seasons. And he is one of the reasons I was offered the position as the radio announcer for the Phil, which is without question the greatest creative pleasure I have ever had. Watching Zarin and the rest of the staff of the New York Philharmonic steer this great ship through a season of classical repertoire humbles me. There are people in my business who earn a lot of money, and I understand that usually that is because the product is popular. But each performance of the Phil brings to its audience the greatest in artistic achievement in our society today. Raising the funds and producing those programs are both as important as each note that is played. This <clears throat> is apples and oranges, no doubt, but as someone who was attempted to be an artist during my lifetime and often fell short due to the commercial imperatives both in my business and in my own nature, I admire those administrators <clears throat> who have dedicated themselves to bringing the ballet, the symphony, or any art you might name to its audience. Now, I suppose it was out of a combination of deeply felt appreciation for the arts and for the artists, as well as a sense of shame over certain of my own creative choices, 
that I formed a partnership with the Capital One banking company to do commercials for them and donate. <laughs> and donate. <clears throat> We're going to have some fun with this. Hold on. <clears throat> to form a partnership with the Capital One Banking Company and to do commercials for them and donate all of my fee to charities, nearly all of those arts related. I recently renewed, no, 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 uh, oh, thank you. I recently renewed uh, my agreement with Capital One and although appearing on television as a spokesperson for a bank at the height of the recent recession, as well as the uh, eruption of the Occupy Wall Street movement, had not been a goal of mine. <laughs> I am proud of the work I have been able to support through my association with them. Capital One has been a thoughtful and constructive partner with me in promoting this work in raising awareness for the arts. I mention this because I wish I had a few billion. I wish I had a few billion. I'd be giving most of that away right now. In my attempt to raise awareness about the arts, to cultivate new generations of both trained performers, performers as well as arts administrators, I have sought to convince others on the boards I sit on, as well as within the general arts benefactor community, that funding for the arts is incontrovertibly one of the most important investments our society can make. I think to myself, how can I help to give as many people as possible the chance that came into my life somewhat late? The opportunity to embrace a unique and disciplined life, pursuing art as a dedicated passion, if not a career. I want more people, especially young people, to have a chance at a life of artistic appreciation, self-expression, and freedom. Freedom from the commercial considerations that so often compromise and eventually suffocate real art. I believe this is something many of us wish we had nurtured in ourselves, especially those of us who are looking back on more years than there are ahead. That brings me to our real purpose here tonight. I first came to Washington to advocate on behalf of federal funding for the arts several years ago. No, it was not during the Teddy Roosevelt administration. <laughs> and yes, Bob Lynch was my host then. I believe we have a photo. Can we see that photo, please? There we are. Here we are. Wow. Let that, let that be a warning of what lobbying in Washington can do to you. <clears throat> Look what it's done to me, how ravaged I am. <clears throat> Actually, it was in 1990 when I was introduced to Americans for the Arts. I learned about the vast network of arts advocacy groups across the country represented by many of you here today. I learned about how much of the fiscal and political paradigm of government support for the arts. I learned about the relative successes, two more recent examples of which are, in 2011, the NEA funded the Blue Star Museums Project, offering free admission to all active duty military personnel and their families to 1,000 museums from Memorial Day to Labor Day in 2011. <clears throat> and currently the NEA funds the highly successful program Poetry Out Loud, a national poetry recitation contest in all 50 states with over 365,000 students competing last year, 2010 to 2011. The 2012 national finals will be here in Washington next month. Although controversial grants involving artists like Karen Finley and Robert Maplethorpe and Andres Serrano are a thing of the past due to the elimination of individual grants, something that I think is a mistake, some detractors... <clears throat> <clears throat> Some detractors still find areas they view as objectionable in more current appropriations. One example that was offered to me that we unearthed today was this. In 2009, in the U.S. Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Congress voted to give $50 million to the NEA, $50 million, to make grants to, the, to arts organizations for the purpose of job creation and preservation. It was a great success. 
helping to create or save over 5,000 jobs in every part of the United States. A self-described, quote, conservative syndicated columnist and Fox News Channel contributor named... Then I have a note here that says, don't really need to give her name recognition, FYI. <laughs> that came from Bob Lipsch, by the way. <laughs> don't really want to give her name recognition, FYI. Conservative syndicated columnist and Fox News Channel contributor, who will remain nameless, came out on Fox News with a list of controversial grants from this program. Her list focused on grants to groups such as a Center for Puppetry, an international accordion festival, the Maine, the Maine Indian Basket Maker Alliance, the California Lawyers for the Arts, all attacked without reference to quality as if simply words like puppetry or basket maker or accordion or lawyer were enough to be ridiculed. <laughs> it seemed like the rest of her list focused on any organization or project that had the words nude, gay, lesbian, ritual, or California in them. <laughs> I'm announcing today the formation of a contest. <laughs> My own personal foundation will be awarding a prize of $5,000 to the person who submits the winning poem. It's a poetry contest a poem which uses the words basket maker, accordion, lawyer, nude, gay, lesbian, ritual in California. <laughs> Early on in this process, I began to grasp what the realities of the business of the arts are in America. I won't rehash for you, the faithful, what all those talking points and statistics are, yet they remain solid unwavering evidence as to the efficacy of this spending. Indulge me as I name three that I think are worth intoning here this afternoon. The arts create economic activity and produce tax revenue. The nonprofit arts industry generates $166.2 billion annually in economic activity, supports 5.7 million full-time equivalent jobs in the arts and related industries, and returns $12.6 billion in federal income tax fees, measured against direct federal cultural spending of about $1.8 billion. That's a return of nearly 9 to 1. That's a st statistic from Americans for the Arts in 2007. Number two, the arts are a magnet for local business. I love this one. A strong arts sector is an economic asset that stimulates business activity, attracting companies that want to offer their employees and clients a creative climate and an attractive community with high amenity value. The arts have been shown to be a successful and st sustainable strategy for revitalizing rural areas, inner cities, and populations struggling with poverty. Arts organizations purchase goods and services that help local merchants thrive. Arts audiences also spend more than $100 billion, $100 billion on admissions, transportation, food, lodging, and souvenirs that boost local economies, again from the 2007 Americans for the Arts report. <clears throat> I have a 16-year-old daughter, so I'm really, really holding my breath on this one. Art students outperform non-art students on the SAT. <laughs> Data from the federal government shows that students who take four years of arts and music classes while in high school, on average, score about 100 points better on their SATs than students who only take one half year or less. This one from the... College Board of 2011, a report on co college-bound seniors. Generates tax revenues, helps the local economy, creates advantages for our children's academic futures, and those are just three that I've mentioned. Yet every year that I have come down here, it's still a battle. There are more things in the budget of our government that are less deserving of federal funding than anything you will ever find in an NEA appropriation, and many of those are rarely, if ever, threatened. However, here you are again, and I am proud to join you in support of your great work rallying the troops, asserting the facts, making our case. The NEA received $175 million in 1992 
20 years later, that figure adjusted for inflation would be $268,500,000. This year, they got $146 million. <clears throat> if I were president, <laughs> it's kind of an insane idea when you think about it. Um, if I were president, I would lobby for a billion dollars to the NEA and the NEH each. Yeah. Yeah. And I would still consider that not enough. However, I've been asked to mention by Bob and Americans for the Arts that they would be happy with an appropriation of just a dollar per U.S. citizen. Bob would be happy with that. Give me $320 million, he says, and Bob would like that. I would also reconstitute the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in order to push public broadcasting closer to its original intended mandate to serve that area of the American public not addressed by the commercial broadcast and cable spectrums. <clears throat> especially now in an age where Americans need increasingly more, not less, unfettered information about the issues that influence, if not outright threaten us, at home and abroad. But if the past many years are an indicator, we should prepare to come back here again and again and again, all the while educating and training new generations of not merely patrons of the arts, but stewards of our own cultural heritage, as well as those of the cultures that preceded ours. How many of you here today, let me just have some applause from how many of you here today are here in Washington to advocate on behalf of an arts group in this country who are under 40 years old? That's the future of this movement right there. I'm going to stop now, but I want you to know that I was in Dallas recently at the Performing Arts Center there. They told me they're going to close up a big piece of the freeway there in Dallas, tear it up, build a park, and unify an area of arts-related facilities into their very own Lincoln Center. I was thrilled to learn that. Dallas, Texas. Yeah. I also wanted to tell you that I'm scheduled to do a show on Broadway next spring, and as always, but as always, the chance to work on a great play with a smart group of people in the theater is as good as it gets creatively in my business. At the same time, I am overwhelmingly grateful for the past several years of doing 30 Rock on NBC. The show is clever. The cast and crew are remarkably dedicated and talented. We consider ourselves lucky to have such wonderful jobs. <clears throat> and yet, on an entirely selfish level, I want to show you one of the reasons why I'm lucky. Can we see that slide, please? This is a painting entitled Sea and Mirrors that was painted by the, the artist Ross Blechner in 1996. I was sent an invitation to an exhibit of Ross's many years ago at the Mary Boone Gallery in New York. The printed material featured a depiction of this painting. Last year, I went to another show of Ross's at Mary's gallery, and I told Mary that I had carried this image on that invitation with me in my daily paperwork for many years because I was so taken with it. Mary paused and said, I know who owns that, and I think there's a chance that it's for sale. I carried this thing in my shoulder bag for probably six or seven years. I love this thing so much. Three months later, it was hanging in my house in my apartment in New York. And even, but I want you to know that even carrying the photograph of this in my bag for seven years was strangely fulfilling to me. <clears throat> but I want to admit that owning it is a lot better. <laughs> but carrying, car <laughs> carrying that card in my bag, I had two of them actually. One was a photographer from East Hampton. I bought that one too. Um, <clears throat> No, but I, carrying this in my, in my bag all those years, I, it, it, it was so fulfilling to me personally. I just loved this art. I, thought, I looked at this thing, I thought, I'm never going to own this painting. But I love it. I just want to have this. I want to see it. I want to look at it, even if I can't look at it on a wall. Because you see, in spite of what I do for a living, in spite of how much rich creativity is potentially around me every day in my field, 
I get my art the way you get your art, as a ticket holder, as an audience member, as a patron. And although I may eventually get on a shorter line than many other people, <laughs> my love of the arts and for artists is no different than yours. And I want as many people as possible to experience that regardless of income, where you live, or whether or not your elected representatives get it as far as the arts movement is concerned. <clears throat> <clears throat> I truly love Ross's paintings. Perhaps that's the new phase I'm in now. Art. Sometimes you've just got to buy it. <laughs> but remember that the path from Ross's painting began with Disney animation, the theme to Captain Kangaroo, Fred Stoll in the seventh grade, Russ Tamblin. My brothers and I, gang fight dancing. <laughs> Brando in the dark theater, and sitting, waiting for a train at Union Station. Artistic appreciation believes that art is like water. It's essential. And I am honored to be here with all of you to carry the water on behalf of the arts again in 2012. Thank you and good night. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Ferguson, Chairman of the American Society of Arts. I thought you would think it was uh, Alec coming back when I came out, but it didn't work that way. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here for our diamond anniversary. This is our 25th year of the Nancy Hanks election. It's really a tremendous thing. And thank you for joining us tonight. And, of course, I want to thank uh, Ben Foles and his band, the, the young artists. I told Ben that I'm from Oklahoma, and he plays faster than I can listen. But, uh, <laughs> but he was great. And, of course, we want to thank uh, Ken Solomon and Maureen Dowd and, of course, our uh, co-chairs for uh, this event this week is uh, Hill Harper and Charles Siggers. So thank them, too. And, of course, if we had more people that looked through a prism like Alec Baldwin, what a better place we would have. So thank you, Alec Baldwin. And, of course, thanks for the Kennedy Center for having us once again. The Kennedy Center has been so generous with us and thank them for letting us use this beautiful space one more time. I hope as you came in tonight, you enjoyed the past 25 years of the uh, slides that were on it. It was a great opportunity. We have seen perspectives of the arts from almost every imaginable uh, part of America. And these 25 years have been wonderful. It was great to listen to, and the retrospective of going back has been great. And of course, we're again glad that Alec Baldwin did our 25th Nancy Hanks lecture. Uh, for those of you that would like to stick around and mingle for a little while, the Kennedy Center said that they would provide food and beverage for purchase right back out as you came in. So go meet new friends and say hello to old friends. Thank you and good night.